Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and Module 4, Ecosystem Dynamics. This is video number 2 and we're going to be reviewing the impact of biotic factors. So the learning intention for this particular video is that you would be able to investigate and determine relationships between biotic and abiotic factors in an ecosystem, including the impact of biotic factors, including predation, competition, and symbiotic relationships. So we're going to narrow our focus now to just looking at biotic factors, uh, the range of different biotic interactions that occur in ecosystems, and also um, just a little bit of a focus on predation, competition, and symbiosis. As we've started to do with some of these videos, we're giving you three different uh, levels of success by which you can measure how well you've understood not only the material in the video, but also the material that you're looking at during class time. Uh, what's, a, I guess, a minimum, a bare minimum that we would like is that you can recall a series of biotic factors which could affect living organisms. Uh, we hope that you should be able to describe particular biotic factors in an ecosystem and the impact of this factor in that ecosystem. And um, for preference, ideally what we would like is that you may be able to evaluate relative importance of different biotic factors within an ecosystem so that you can look at an ecosystem, study an ecosystem and pick out some of the range of different biotic interactions that occur and why they might be important in that ecosystem. So let's look at this table. We've looked at this before. We've got um, effect of organism one and the effect on organism two as we um, look through this particular table. And so any particular cell is going to um, reflect what is happening to organism one, which for competition can potentially be harm, and likewise for, for organism two. So if we've got two organisms both competing for the same resource, the same mate, the same food, or to get away from the same predator, then in each case there's potential harm. You've got to win that competition or you're harmed. Um, so often the determiner of, of which species is, or which individual or species is harmed on which is benefiting um, can change and depending on the nature of the competition. The competition can create um, alliances and we know that there are certain hunters for example that are pack hunters and they benefit from uh, joining forces rather than competing against each other for resources but again there's some of the other examples that we'll look at a little bit later on. For this particular um, video and, and as you can get a sense there are a range of different ways in which um, biological organisms can exist or coexist with one another um, that can benefit either or both or provide harm to either or both. And so we can't look at all of those, certainly in a video like this, or at least we're not going to today. So um, we're going to focus on a couple, uh, predation, where the predator obviously benefits from the relationship and the prey uh, experiences some harm. Uh, we will mention some examples of symbiosis, which include... Um, benefits to one or both of the partners in mutualism where the feeling is mutual and both benefit and commensalism where one benefits and the other isn't particularly benefited nor harmed in uh, in the relationship um, so as long as there's no harm done then uh, and another species benefits and that's commensalism so let's have a look at a couple of these in a little bit more detail as we do that it's important to keep in mind ecological principle number two and I've mentioned to you before that we are going to try and build up our understanding of ecology and ecosystem dynamics by collecting some of these ecological principles that help us to contextualize what it is that we're doing and of course the most important uh, relationship that we want to have a look at is uh, the predator prey relationship Predation is obviously something that's going to be critical in ecosystems. They're the foundation of our food chains and food webs that we can build for ecosystems. And they help us to identify the flow of energy through an ecosystem in terms of what eats what um, and where the energy that's, that's being um, locked up in chemicals uh, by uh, producers, by autotrophs like plants, um, to where that energy is flowing as we look through the different trophic levels in an ecosystem through, through food chains and food webs. So the main factors that affect predator-prey interactions include a potential increase in predator numbers relative to prey, 
increase in predator numbers relative to prey. Refuging, um, finding a refuge, finding places that are safe. Um, density dependence of predators and prey. So how um, how do the numbers compare? And we're going to have a look at a couple of graphs to get a sense of of some of these key things. Any alternative food for the predators and also any alternative enemies for the prey. Whether an individual predator species spends most of its life in or on an individual prey and also um, the problem of getting from one prey to another if it is actually in fact um, living on the prey. So these are some of the key factors that affect the numbers of predators and prey. So let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So these are the sorts of graphs that you often get. And I've picked these uh, examples of the lynx and the Arctic hare, um, partly because the Arctic hare is a nice example of um, a, a natural selection in action, nice uh, light colored fur, which helps to camouflage it against the, the light colored background of the snow graph that we would want you to interpret when we're looking at predator-prey interactions. Now, if I asked you about this graph, I'm probably going to ask you two things. One, to describe the pattern that you see, and two, to explain the pattern that you see. So a description is just what's there. Now, what's there looks like um, a whole lot of information, and we want to try and tease out what are the key patterns that we see. Well, firstly, there's a blue line. The blue line is representative of the Arctic hares. So that's the prey species. Now you can see that this, this is a line that's fluctuating. So it's got some peaks uh, and it's also got some troughs where it's, it's almost a couple of occasions over the years has dropped down to um, virtually zero, very, very low numbers. Uh, so this is giving us a little bit of an idea about how the numbers of prey animals vary from one season to another. So obviously if you can uh, get more pelts, then there's obviously a lot of more of the animals around. So we see a couple of important things we can describe. Firstly, that the pattern is relatively uh, repetitious. So it rises to a peak, drops to a, a, a low or trough, rises to another peak and drops and rises and drops. Um, so that's a pattern. The peaks are not all at the same place, so some of the peaks are higher than others. So we can see that some peaks uh, represent much larger populations than some of the other peaks. And likewise, the trough, sometimes the dip doesn't dip right down to almost zero. It dips down to a low value, but not quite zero. We also see a red line here, and the red line is the number of lynxes. So that's telling us something about that population. You can also see that as with the Arctic hares, the lynx population rises and falls. So we see again this pattern of uh, peaks for the lynx and also troughs for the lynx. Now, one of the important things is that you can see that the, and, and this is again a description, it's not telling you why, it's just a description, but I can see that, for example, my peak here for the uh, prey species is followed by a peak for the predator species. So whilst they both peak, they don't peak at the same time. Likewise, if I concentrate on the um, trough or the low below that peak for my prey species, my predator trough is again displaced. So what we need to keep in mind when we're looking at this is increase in numbers only occur for two reasons, either new babies are born or we get immigration, that is individuals moving into the area. They're the only two reasons. Numbers go down likewise for two um, comparable reasons. Deaths, so animals die, when that could be due to predation or any other reason, uh, or emigration, they actually leave the area. So numbers are only going to increase um, through birth or immigration, numbers are only going to decrease through death and immigration. And given the fact that we want to sort of think about this as a population where we're not worrying too much about movement in and out, we explain the peaks most easily by high birth rates. So maybe high birth rates reflect greater availability of food, which applies to both the prey and the predator species. And of course, um, 
drastic drops are going to be increased death rates, a lot more individuals dying than are being born. And that, again, can be due to scarcity of food, which is one of the reasons why we see the predator um, drops after the prey is dropped, because obviously the predator numbers are high. There aren't as many prey animals, so not as many of those predators predators can survive and so therefore we see their numbers drop off again and as the numbers of the predators drop so the number of prey can start to increase again. This is why we see these staggered patterns. So it's important that you are clear of the difference between describing a pattern which is just telling me what you see and telling me as many of the things that you can see as you can and also explain what's actually in behind these patterns. How do we explain increases Uh, And that could be just uh, coinciding with breeding cycles. How do we explain decreases? And that could just be a result of increased predation, but it could be other factors as well. So therefore, if we wanted to focus specifically on predators and prey, we would be looking at some of these as being the key factors that contribute to that. So the first is competition. Competition between predators for prey. There's also competition between prey for food or shelter. And I guess also we could add um, for avoiding predation. So the prey animals need food themselves. They also need somewhere to be protected from predators. But if if they do encounter a predator, then they need to avoid that predator. And obviously, if there's a group of prey animals, the predator may pick off one or other on, on the basis of um, even just speed or how easily they are seen if it's a camouflaged animal, such as we saw with the Arctic hare. Disease can be another factor that can affect both predator and prey populations. Seasonal behaviour, so this, this comes down to things like our immigration and emigration values. If a species is migratory or hibernates, Hibernates isn't actually going to um, cause them to leave the area, but technically, in a sense, they are. They're not around anymore. They're in a cave or they're somewhere quiet where they're not actually interacting with the environment. So that's another area that we can can have a look at in terms of changing numbers. And uh, as is often the case for prey animals, reproductive cycles, which are generally larger for prey than they are for predators. And that makes sense if you think about predators, Uh, will need to eat a prey animal, for example, but then at some point in their life, they'll need to eat another one. So the number of prey animals needed to sustain a predator is much greater than the actual number of predators. So this is why we see these numbers. And again, it's part of the explanation for why the prey numbers on those graphs are always much higher than the predators. And if they're not, then you get a very massive drop very quickly Uh, in the predator numbers because there's just not enough food to go around. The symbiotic interactions is literally about living together. And when species live together, there are a lot of ways they may do this for various different types of benefits. And you will look at a few more of these. We've actually done some of this through our look at um, biological diversity in module three. And so we already know, for example, that the mosquito is going to be uh, in a parasitic relationship most of the time. It may prey on the blood of uh, its its, um, prey, but it may also be something that is a uh, what we call a vector. Um, and vectors can transport parasites from one host to another. And that is certainly the case for mosquitoes with malaria and the plasmodium that causes that particular disease. So mosquitoes are an interesting one because we could, we could regard them as a predator that's simply feeding on the blood of its prey. Uh, we may also consider them to be reasonably parasitic. They um, make us make the host unwell without actually killing it off. Uh, The goby and the shrimp uh, is an example of mutualism. And this is one that we did look at in class um, where the goby fish is the uh, lookout, uh, keeps the blind shrimp um, protected as the little shrimp digs out the cave. And they both benefit in some way from this relationship. So it's, it's the feeling is mutual if the benefit is to each. If only one gets a benefit and the other one doesn't, then we call it commensalism. And this is Nemo. We're all familiar with the clownfish Nemo, or at least most of us are. And we know that it lives in um, anemones. And we don't know any particular reason why the anemone might benefit. I guess if the 
clownfish is a particularly messy eater, it might um, spill its food there and some of that nutrient may be picked up by the anemone. But there's no real direct benefit to the anemone, but there certainly is a protective benefit to the clownfish in being uh, within the anemone, protecting it from predators. So the clownfish benefits, the anemone's not particularly harmed in any way or, or um, gaining any benefit. Um, so it's an example of commensalism. And as I mentioned before, sometimes uh, where individual animals are in competition for a particular um, resource, which might be their prey, sometimes that competition can uh, spark some collaboration, as there can be amongst hunters, where they will work together and share the results of um, their collaboration. So if there's a kill, all of the individuals involved in that kill will be able to eat, and usually the other family members as well. So these are all examples of symbiotic interactions. We will look at some of these in a little bit more detail and obviously we're also going to be doing some field work uh, that'll allow us to put together some of the key interactions that occur in different ecosystems. Thanks for watching.